Eyes on Longmont, offering a diversity of topics about our community that will inform and entertain you. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Eyes on Longmont. The Doherty Museum houses a collection of antique automobiles, trucks, tractors, and musical instruments. It is located on Highway 287, about a mile south of Longmont. In the early 1970s, the Doherty family decided to open their private collections to the public. In 1974, they began construction of a 29,000-square-foot building, which was completed in 1977. It is now open during the months of June, July, and August on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. It is also the site of the annual Yesteryear Farm Show, which is held the last weekend in August. The show features working displays of antique tractors and farm machinery, steam engines, stationary engines, threshing and baling demonstrations, blacksmithing, spinning and weaving, etc., Today, we will be looking at the agriculture machinery. Join us as we go inside. Hello, my name is Doug Doherty. Welcome to the Doherty Museum. Joining me today is my good friend, Bob Howard. Bob, today we're going to give a little more information about various machines in the museum. And here's an example of one of them. This tractor is steam powered. Bob, it's an Altman Taylor. The next tractor we'll move to is also an Altman Taylor. Altman Taylor built gas and steam at the same time. Steam was maybe on its way out, gas was coming in. There was an overlap period there. This is the biggest model they made, a 2575. And again, it's steam. And there's a whole different way of rating steam at this time, I think. But anyway, it was a big tractor. It would do a lot of work. An interesting sidelight on this tractor, it was owned by Norman Thronson. His farm was down here at the intersection of 287 and 52 on the northeast corner. The buildings and stuff are still there. Um, I have a picture in the back here. We might get to it showing Thorvald and Norman, his brother. Thorval has, we have his engine in here too. He lived over on uh, Nelson Road, just north of the new uh, high school, Silver Creek. And the big horse barn there has been covered in metal siding, so you don't realize it's an old wood structure. But it must have held 30 some horses one time, a huge barn. Wow. And it's a good thing they put the metal on it to preserve it, but it changed the looks of it entirely but otherwise the weather would have gotten to it over time probably. But anyway, this engine, like I say, thrashed in this area southeast of Longmont. My dad remembered this engine coming to their farm to thrash in 1918 and 19. Saw it pull in the yard. He was a, still a young boy. And during the 30s, the engine left this area and kind of disappeared. Dad didn't know where it was. And Somebody was up hunting near the Caribou Ranch and found it at the Bluebird Mine. And the county has restored the Bluebird Mine and made it available to the public. So you can go up there and see the same site. It was on the uh, railroad grade, I believe it was the Switzerland Trail. that went all through the mountains, all the gold mines and camps up there. It was quite a railroad network, if you ever read a book about it, called the Switzerland Trail. Anyway, my dad found this engine in the went up and visit, saw that it was in a shed. A building had been built over it to protect it from the weather, and they used it, we believe, to run an electric generator, a dyno, for the mine. And he located the owner by tax records who was in Texas and was able to purchase it. And the man said, one condition, you've got to put the building back just like you found it. And it didn't have a door, it was built after the tractor went in there, so that presented a bit of a problem. I remember going up there for a week every day. I was 10, uh, 10 years old, 
and the Thorvald Thronson went with us, and I didn't realize at the time, but this was his brother's engine, so Thorvald had probably been around it anyway, and got it running. And that during the 30s, during the scrap drive, vandals, or whatever you want to call it, had broken in there, and they'd taken the smokestack off, and the front firebox door, and the firebox door, and anything they could bust with a hammer and get some cast iron, they'd broken it off of it. So a lot of temporary patches were made to get it steamed up because they figured the only way to get it out of there is to get it steamed up and drive it out on the railroad grade about five miles to the highway, the dirt road then going north out of Netherland. So that was quite a little process, but <laughs> Thorval was a steam man through and through. And they got it going. I remember to get it out of the shed after taking the end off, we'd wrap a rope around that flywheel and hook it on the pickup. and. Uh, Pickup would run 50 feet, and that'd make a few revolutions, and the tractor would move a couple feet. Then you get up there, wind the rope up again, and do it again. And once you had it outside, then they could fire it up. And so one day, they arranged for Golden Transfer to bring his low boy up there on the dirt road, and uh, we met him, and drove it out with no problem. For our problems, I had fun because I got to drive the truck out following the procedure, but again, at two miles an hour, I couldn't get into a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> when you were 10 years old? Yeah. Of course, I'd driven stuff on the farm before. But anyway, it had enough steam to go up on the low boy. It came down Boulder Canyon and uh, rolled it off right out here. Had enough steam pressure on it to back it off. So it uh, was used several years here thrashing on the farm. My dad would shock about 10, 15 bushels of acres of barley just as an excuse to play with these things. And uh, neighbors would come over and help people around here. Howard Morton, for one, had been raised on steam, running his dad's custom outfit, Howard Morton of Morton Heights. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember my job at that time, I would sit up here and I knew how to shut things down if something was going bad. That was my extent of it. I missed out on that pitching bundles era. <laughs> Yeah, you just put the belt over that big wheel and then it runs up to the separator. And uh, RPM, I'm totally guessing, 250 maybe, something like that. I really don't know what the separator's required. But uh, if you could run a cross belt by turning it, it was much easier to control it in a wind. If you had a side wind with a straight belt, it might throw it off sometimes. So if you could run a cross belt, and with a steamer, you can run it either way. So you could always run a cross belt if you wanted to, because the separator has to turn a predetermined direction of rotation. Several hours from cold, you'd start them on a wood fire first to raise the temperature slowly. And then once you had them good and warm and maybe a little steam pressure, then you'd fire them with coal and get a lot more heat out of it. But it's always a good idea to bring them up slowly on wood. Um, this was a water tank. That's not original, but it was put on here to run. And to keep one of these running, you had to have a, in the early days, they had a team of a water wagon that was running pretty steady all the time from a water source to the tractor to pump it off by a hand pump and go get another load. Uh, coal, we could bring that in a wagon. Well, that wasn't too big an issue as far as keeping it going during the day, but water definitely was a big issue. This area was Fortunately, we had good south mountain water, so you didn't have scale build up in the boiler like you would in the hard water areas farther east. And so steam was very successful and popular in this area. They ran them a long time. Uh, does the sign tell me that uh, this one doesn't? It's uh, probably around 26,000, I guess, 13 ton. These tractors going down the county roads uh, caused a lot of bridge improvement to happen. <laughs> and you see old pictures of them where they broke through a wood bridge made for the horse era. And uh, this wheel is kind of interesting. It's cast, it's a one piece cast wheel. Now, I don't know how they did that. <clears throat> Most of them are in sections, maybe two halves put together. This is, there's no break in it. And uh, it's cast iron, it's about an inch thick right here, and the lugs, it's all one piece. Mm. Well, 
Fulton Taylor was a popular company. They made a lot of a whole line of equipment, thrashing machines, a full line of equipment, anything you wanted, pretty much. I think Altman Taylor, you get with the Altman Taylor brand. The engine the next one we'll move to is also an Altman Taylor. It's their gas tractor, the biggest gas tractor model they made. And it was used in this area to thrash also. It was brought in here from Nebraska in the mid 40s during World War II and was used to thrash in this area. Again, the combines weren't handling it in the area. People were still thrashing. And then we'll get into it a little further. The Thronson brothers, Thorvald and Norman, were uh, significant operators in this area handling grain for many farmers. I'd like to thank you for visiting today the Dory Museum. Uh, we're open in the summertime, the three months, June, July, and August. Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays. And our hours are uh, 11 to 5. And we hope to see you come visit and get more information. If you have any questions on this equipment, we have a good staff here who can help answer questions. I want to thank Boulder County again for providing us in their uh, tax work off program. So they have people here who are docents and can man the desk. And it really helps the family in keeping it open three days a week. During the summer, we use the season is usually 13 weeks. I also want to thank Bob for helping me out today. And Bob's the main cog, one of the main cog wheels of the farm show that happens every August. I believe it's the weekend before Labor Day. It's a three-day show we have here on the field north of the museum, and we have a, usually a couple hundred tractors or so come in and various other things to see. So it's really quite interesting show and a lot of educational people can actually see this stuff working, which is a lot better than just a static display sometimes. Again, thank you for visiting and hope to see you come visit the museum in the future.